And so let's 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 kick things off because I think we have been joined by uh, some people here and feel like we've already had a huge panel discussion. <laughs> so why why not bring everyone in? Welcome everyone to Hi. Uh, an incredible uh, discussion that we're going to have with uh, the accidental icon herself. Uh, you know, what I wanted to say before we begin are just a few quick housekeeping notes. One is this panel is going to be uh, recorded so you can access it on Glam Hive's platform after the conference is over. Um, huge thank you to our presenting sponsors, uh, especially uh, Mary Kay. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Lynn, the accidental icon, who, you know, has a really interesting journey to to where she has created this digital and social brand uh, because she feels like she did had trouble finding a fashion blog or magazine that that spoke to her in a way. Uh, so Lynn, welcome here. Let's let's kick things off. Um, let's talk a little bit about the genesis of the accidental icon. You were, as you just mentioned a second ago, you were in academia at the collegiate level. How did the accidental icon sort of come to be part of your world? So I think just a little backstory yeah. is that I've had this um, sort of disposition that I always have to reinvent and refresh whatever I'm doing. And yeah. so I've done that throughout my entire career. And uh, I, I will basically find something that is interesting to me. I will then read and do everything I can to master it. And then um, after about five years, I get a little bored and I'm ready to do it again. Right. So, um, I think there were two things that happened around the time that I started Accidental Icon. One was I had just turned 60. My initial response to being older was not happy. <laughs> um, I really had to go through a process uh, about it where I have, as you can tell, um, complete acceptance of yeah. it. And then I was becoming frustrated and disillusioned with my ability to really engage and talk about issues that were really important to me. Yeah. And I felt like I was not able to express myself in a creative way. Yeah. And so all my other reinventions were always involving um, creative activities. For example, um, I was becoming very bored in one of the jobs I was doing, a lot of training and consulting around trauma. And so I started to work with an acting company and we developed a way to go into places and perform and as a way of opening up conversations. Yeah. And so that was how I always did it. So this time I was at the point in my life where I had taken care of a lot of responsibilities. My daughter was married. Um, she had been through college and um, I always was interested in fashion mm -hmm. as a way of expressing your identity. And for me, that's how I always used it. I wasn't into trends or things like that. It was more, you know, who am I? What time am I living in? And how am I going to, you know, show that, show who I am living in that time through right. my clothes? So I decided to just start taking continuing ed classes at a local fashion school. I had no idea what I, I was going to come out with. Yeah, And that's the best way to do this if right. I'm giving people advice. Yeah. And I took a whole range of classes in jewelry fabrication, sewing, um, fashion marketing, 
um, social media. And in all of the different classes that I took, uh, the professors and the students would say, you have amazing style, you should start a blog. And so as I was exploring all of these things, I, you know, I was really interested in maybe designing jewelry or accessories or, but I realized that in order to be good at it, like anything else, it takes time and practice. Mm -hmm. And so I was really feeling like I wanted to do something more immediately. And so they were telling me, you know, you should start a blog. And I was like, okay, I'm, I know how to do technology because I'm a professor and I have my little wardrobe and I know how to write. Yep. And so I taught my first, um, my first website, I taught myself how to make myself, um, which I was very proud of. <laughs> and my life partner, who's also a daytime nerd, nighttime creative, um, he, he is a photographer and he agreed to take the photos. Yeah. And so basically I was using it in the early years as a way for me to really dig into fashion as a system, to really find out about it, to really understand designers, what inspires them, who are all the players. Um, and so I had no expectations. I had no contacts in the fashion industry. I knew nothing. I just knew that I was feeling very fulfilled yeah. being creative. Yeah. And so I just put it out and unbelievable things <laughs> have uh, happened. Well, you know, I think what's so interesting about what you do, Lynn, is you describe Accidental Icon as for women who live interesting but ordinary lives. And I find that interesting because I think a lot of people might think of interesting and ordinary as antithetical, but you don't think of that them as that way. Can you explain what an interesting but ordinary life is to you? Well, I think, you know, when I first started, we were probably at the height of celebrity culture. Yeah. And so you know, magazines that I used to love, Vogue, you know, they were becoming completely about celebrity. Right. And not the beautiful editorials and the good writing about women's lives that yeah. these magazines used to be. Right. And so I think that by ordinary, I mean, you don't have to be a celebrity. You know, for most of my life, I was a social worker and a professor, not exorbitantly wealthy, mm -hmm. um, to have a life that is actually, you know, stimulating and helps you grow and um, is special. Yeah. And so I think even, you know, my photos, I... My partner um, is his initial photography was film photography. He only bought a digital camera to help me. Yeah. So he has no knowledge of Photoshop. <laughs> so none of my photos are touched. They're completely yeah. unretouched. Yeah. And so you see, sometimes I'm dressed in this beautiful outfit, but there's a little bit of garbage at my feet. That's not you know, taken out of the photo. Yeah. And so I'm on everyday streets in New York City. Yeah. As I've, you know, been fortunate to become successful, I've been able to travel and do more um, and show you Paris and things like that. But if you look at the majority of my photos, it's me every day on ordinary streets right. in New York, living my best life. Right, right. I, and you know, a lot of the panels that 
that we've I've moderated today, social media and personal branding has been a, a thread that has been woven through a lot of them because I think it's just so much of a part of what professionals in fashion and beauty are thinking about right now and ruminating on. And I, so I wanted to ask you, you know, there seem to be different philosophies. You look at some people's feeds and they're highly curated and very homogenous and they have a certain look and that's what they're going for. Others, more more of a mishmash, more eclectic. Where do you kind of fall on that? And, and what makes something on or off brand for the accidental icon? Well, I think, you know, one, one thing and one way I have approached this um, is that I have ethics about who I choose to work with, um, what I might promote, Mm -hmm. and I've really stuck to that yeah and one of the things that I've done also is I mean I've literally turned down it at this point it must be thousands of dollars um, to work with uh, people that want to portray aging in a way that is not how I think of aging. Yeah. And so um, I have a really clear vision about that. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm a one woman with my photographer man show. Right. I don't have assistants. I don't have people following me around, taking care of my social media. So I'm basically doing it in the moment. Yeah. Right? right. I do not have much planning. I don't have posts all lined up. You know, our process has very much been, you know, getting up on a Saturday and Calvin saying, OK, what do you have to shoot? Where should we go? I'm like, hmm, I don't know. Where have we not been for a while? Right. And we go and we start just interacting with the environment. Yeah. And then the photo will come and then we're like, OK, let's go have brunch. <laughs> and so that's been my approach all along. And yeah. and why I like it is that it's very flexible mm -hmm. and it lets me continue to evolve and grow as a person. And, you know, I, I'm not a fan of this idea that you're a brand yeah, because then um, you become commodified. Yeah. And I've had to fight that. Um, and it's been interesting because we were talking about the media before, but when I first started, most of the press I received was about me, just me, being this like, how did this woman do this? You know, this, it's kind of like a fluke, a Cinderella story. And I worked with a lot of really creative independent magazines and I, I was just loving every minute of it. And slowly over time, right, the media changed from making me be a unique person with a unique story to these articles that are, oh, here's some Instagrammas you should follow. You're right. <laughs> and they basically throw together a bunch of women on Instagram who have gray hair. Yeah. And they don't discriminate, right? <laughs> between who's monetizing, who's doing what. And, and I have to say, I work very hard yeah. to get to where I have got to. Yeah. And I've been strategic about it. And so when you're just putting me in a group because of the color of my hair and my age, yeah. you know, it, it's something that strips you of your identity, strips sure. you of your accomplishments. Sure. And so I now um, have a policy. I don't participate in any shoot or any interview or anything that segregates me by age. Yeah. And so if you want to talk about me as an influencer, then put me in with influencers of all ages who have 750,000 followers. Yeah. 
right? So because though every single one of those was earned. Yeah. I think that's so, so interesting. And what I'd like to circle back on something that you just mentioned and get your take on something because this, you know, as a beauty editor is a, a conversation that we're having a lot in the industry. And it's about this term that is thrown around in the beauty industry, which is anti-aging. And right. it, there seem to be some who take great issue with the term and, and others who say, look, it's part of a vernacular that is something that consumers can just easily understand. What are your thoughts about this term? Do you have any feelings about it either way? I do. I think it is um, a term that feeds into the fear of women yeah. about getting older and losing their attractiveness. So that it's something we must resist at all costs. And so buy this. In your anxiety about this, buy this. And for me, um, what I found is that aging is inevitable. Mm -hmm. There is no one product that is going to intervene. No product that is going to stop it. Yeah. And so by embracing it and looking for beauty products and things that allow you to be the best that you can be, that you might have wrinkles, but this product is making your skin glow. Yeah. And it's really making your skin look healthy and hydrated because then you're glowing, yeah. whether you have wrinkles or not. Yeah. And so for me, I don't like it because I feel that it's a manipulative term. Yeah. And so whether it's sold things before or not, and it's part of the beauty industry, I really don't care <laughs> yeah. because it, it, it is feeding into something that, by the way, younger people should know. I tell, I tell them this research all the time that If you have negative cognitions about getting older or being old, it increases your risk of cardiovascular death and takes seven years off the end of your life. Right. So is it worth being stressed out about anti-aging when you're 35? Right. No. No. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Uh, You know, Lynn, I feel like a lot of people you know, focus and have, have, have focused on your, your style, your fashion style. It's eclectic, it's iconic, but I can't help but notice the beauty looks, the red lips, the haircut, um, which are, are all part of, I think, the, the, the package. What, what is your beauty philosophy or your personal approach to, to beauty? I think my personal approach to beauty is um, to really understand what your strengths are and what your limitations are. And I know that we have a big movement about positivity and loving every aspect of yourself. I mean, in general, I love myself, but I don't like my upper arm. So, (laughs) so my philosophy about beauty is what can I do? Again, it goes to how do I enhance the things about me right. that, that I like? And then how do I minimize um, the things that I don't? And even, I mean, this is a very interesting thing, which most people don't believe because my picture is taken so frequently but when I started I hated having my picture taken my family does not have pictures of me (laughs) until accidental icon and now there's a plethora and one of the ways I handled that to make myself take this risk that is the secret behind my sunglasses yeah oh is that when I had those sunglasses on for whatever reason it made me feel safe enough to go out there yeah. and really, really project. And 
I remember the first time uh, when I was represented by a modeling agency, I had the best agent ever. Um, and I was in London and I was for the very first time in my entire life going to be on TV. And I was beyond anxious, yeah. beyond. I could barely function. So my agent is telling the producer, let her put her sunglasses on, <laughs> which they didn't like because of the glare, but they finally agreed. And then I was able to do, okay, I'll, I'll do the interview. Right. So as you can see tonight, I've gotten beyond that. I can have an interview without sunglasses. We all grow, yeah. but, but that's my approach to beauty and also personal style, right? Clothes have given me so much, so many tools. I would say more than beauty products um, that allow me to convey whatever I want to convey about myself yeah. at any given time. Yeah. So, you know, my next question is actually one that has also been echoed by one of our uh, audience members, which is, Getting back to your process, where do you find inspiration? What, what inspires you when you're creating? I think, and again, this goes back to that ordinary woman with interesting lives. I can be inspired by just about everything. And what it means is that you go into the same place you go into every day, but you decide to look at it in a different way. Yeah. And so then it becomes inspiring. Yeah. So I think an everyday object, like I might be thinking, okay, what could I write about today? And I'll see something on my desk. And I'll say, oh, that reminds me of the time when I da 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 da. And then it becomes an inspirational thing. And this is my message to people. We have these big grand ideas of what being creative means. Like you have to be a filmmaker and you have to be a painter. And I think we, if you stop and you look at how many problems a day you solve, just even something as simple of as, okay, I fooled around with a recipe today and I made a better dish. Yeah. That's creativity. Right. That's what I mean by interesting and ordinary, putting it together. Right. And, and I, do, I do, I must say, I have several newsletters that I will look through. I use Instagram for inspiration. There's a lot of people I follow who aren't in fashion, who have nothing to do with what I do, but I love how they think and I love their images. And so I can look at something from one of them and then I'm off on a daydream. And isn't it, you know, you just said thinking about the things that are in your everyday environment isn't doesn't that just come back to also this idea of just observing and sort of being in the moment and taking the time to kind of be in the moment and observe absolutely and that's what you know i've i've tried to manage that tension yeah between staying small enough that i can do that and not have to be working every single minute. Yeah. Um, I also, I have to tell you, I am very, very inspired by my followers. Yeah. And if you look at my Instagram, since COVID, I, I always did a lot of writing on my blog and on my website. Yeah. But since COVID, I've been sharing more on Instagram, writing more than just a caption. And the conversations and the comments of the women who follow me are, and, and some men, are, are just so smart and um, exciting. And uh, I try to respond. I, I'd rather spend much more time responding to my followers' comments than 
going around and making sure I'm commenting on other people's, you know, um, because at the end of the day, you're here through the grace of your followers, right? Yeah, sure. That's sure. what makes you um, become known. That's what makes you, allows you to maybe generate some income. Mm -hmm. um, I take none of them for granted. Yeah. We talked a little bit about your process for putting an image together, but I'd like to talk to you, to you about your process for putting together a look. How does that come together for you? Is there a process? Is it intuitive? What, how does that, how does that work for you? Well, I think I've always said that the way I think about dressing, I call it, uh, it's very performative. And what I mean by that is that I will get up and I'll see what kind of a mood I'm in. And then I will think about, okay, what do I have to do today? Where am I going? Um, what, what outcome do I have? Right. What, what do I want to convey about who I am on this particular day? And then I will have some thoughts about what looks or what articles of my clothes can better help me to convey that. Yeah. So for example, if, you know, when I was still teaching, if I was going to a conference and I was presenting, um, I would always wear black and white. Mm -hmm even though it was crazy black and white, like a ripped up comb de garçon skirt, because people could say, okay, she doesn't look like anyone else here, but we still can't say she's inappropriate. <laughs> so I, I like that line. I like right. playing in the middle line, right? So um, it is trial and error. It's very experimental. So I'll look at my racks and I'll grab something and I'll say, okay, I like that or I don't try something else. And then my body tells me when it's right. Yeah. I can feel the clothes on my body and it's telling me this is right. Yeah. And one of the things that Ray Kawakuba did, um, when she started Combe des Garcons and she had her first store, is she did not have any mirrors in her store because she wanted you to feel how the clothes felt. She right. didn't want you to be distracted by these ideals that other people put forth. Yeah. And what I have found is no matter what I put on, if, I, if my body says, okay, this is the right thing, I, I will look smashing. Yeah, right. So again, regardless, regardless, you know, 20 people who I'm with might be wearing Chanel yeah. and I might be wearing consignment clothes, yeah. but I, I will stand out yeah. because of my comfortability. And it's, I call it styling from the inside out right. instead of the outside in. So what advice do you have for people to find joy in their own wardrobes. I think there is that, that, that thing for, for a lot of women and men where they open their closet and they look in there and it's a closet full of clothes and nothing to wear. How do you reclaim some of the joy? You chose those pieces. So how do you sort of bring them back to life? Well, one of the things I do, and this is also another, um, way that I inspire myself is I hang on to my clothes because I remember why I bought them. Yeah. And I also remember what I have done in them. Yeah. And so they contain memories and parts of me that can get awakened if I wake up on a particular day and that's how I feel yeah you know for example I still have some t-shirts from when I was in my 20s and so when I want to feel like that and I want to blast you know the rolling stones up to the highest volume 
I will wear one of those t-shirts. And I think, you know, I did a, a styling feature on the Today Show. And most of the time, the shows want you to, like, look at the woman and then give them a look and restyle them. And I did something a little different. I asked each of the women to identify three things that they really loved about themselves or that they wanted to um, get to be able to convey about themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I had them take an article of clothing and you could do this in your closet and you look at it and you say, does that convey that? Yeah. And if it doesn't convey your essence, then recycle and really develop a, what I call a meaningful wardrobe. Yeah, right. And that's how I also think about any buying of clothes that I do yeah. is this is going to be something that I will have when, you know, for the next 50 years. Yeah, right. So you talked a little bit about styling other people in that Today Show segment. And I want to ask you about that because I think a lot of people here may be wardrobe stylists themselves or aspiring wardrobe stylists. When it comes to styling other people, putting together looks for other people, what is the magic sauce there in, in your opinion? I, I, I have resisted styling others. Yeah. Um, because again, I believe it's from your inside out. Yeah. Um, I might make suggestions. Mm -hmm. I might say, um, why don't you try a risk? Mm -hmm. My suggestions are more around risk. Yeah. So this is what you normally do. And I, I have small risks that I might say to a woman, you know, just for the hell of it, wear red lipstick tomorrow. Yeah. Or try big earrings or something like that. And then as people get more comfortable with the risking, right, they, they will try more and more experimentation. Yeah. It's an experiment. Yeah. It's like, you know, using different colors of paint. Yeah. It's really, if you don't like it, you don't buy it. But right. what's the harm in trying? Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, I, what I would do if, if I had a job where I was styling others is I would really sit down and really speak with that person mm -hmm. and find out a lot about who they are, what they care about. Um, what's important to them. And I think from that conversation, ideas would flow yeah. about, you know, what to, what to put together. Yeah. Right. So pivoting a little bit here, you know, and this is something we were talking about a little bit before the, the panel officially started. This year has been a transformative year for everyone. How has this year affected how you communicate with your audience on social media? So I think, you know, as we said before, because up until 2014, when I started Accidental Icon, I've always been a social worker and then subsequently a professor of social welfare. And so... Um, for me, a lot of the big issues that happened this year are things that I've been working on outside of social media for many, many years. Yeah. Um, I think the way that, that Black Lives Matter, COVID um, has changed me is that I have allowed myself to become much more vulnerable mm. with my audience. Mm -hmm. And I've written a lot more, even on Instagram, about how I'm feeling and um, what I might be worried about or 
what are the silver linings or, you know, I, I wrote a lot before the election about having to manage anxiety. And, um, and so I, I found that people really seem to appreciate hearing more about who I am yeah. as a person, not just the accidental icon. And, and that has felt very good to me. And I like that way of communicating. It feels more authentic and sure. real to me. Sure. Um, and as I said, it's so inspiring to me yeah. to read the comments that are left on my Instagram or on my blog. Well, isn't that, I think, something that we all took for granted until this year was connection and, and social connection. And I, I think that makes so much sense that people are yearning for that even on social media platforms, for sure. Yes. And I think, I think it goes back to something I said that there's, um, and for people who are thinking of doing this and um, building a following, I literally would prefer to have less followers. Yeah. And the reason why is because when I first started, I did very simple little things. Like every time I got a new follower, I would send them a rose emoji. Yeah. And I still have those very same followers yeah. today. Yeah. At some point, I would say it happened about two years ago when a few platforms wrote about me and it went viral and I would get like 200,000 new followers in 24 hours. Yeah. I felt like I lost control yeah. of my engagement. Right. And right. so I would much prefer, and even though I have all these followers, I think there's probably about maybe a quarter or half who are very, very engaged with me. Right. And that is what I would prefer, Perf prefer. to be honest. Yeah. I think that leads to my next question nicely, which sadly I think is going to have to be my last, um, which is, you know, for people who are, again, as you just mentioned, looking to build a following what do you think is the key there? What advice would you have for people looking to stand out on social media? Well, I think you have to have good partners. Mm -hmm. So I have to say I've had an amazing partner with GoDaddy. Mm -hmm. And there have been many people across the country who have seen my commercial. So many people who are like, okay, I can use a website, I can use a newsletter, I can use social media to um, make the world I want. That yeah. was the essence of the commercial. And I think for me right now, be yourself. Yeah. Try to, um, I think good pictures yeah. are important, but yeah. not over processed. Yeah. I think an interesting, you know, kind of composition or something like that without a lot of filtering and retouching and all of that, that one of the things I always said about um, putting up unretouched photos is that there's no layers between me and my audience. Yeah. Right. And that so I think cool. less right. layers, right? Yeah. I think find yourself a lot of people think websites are, you know, kind of obsolete, but I have different audiences for different platforms. Yeah. So I think exploring the, the utility and um, how each different platform may advance your goals yeah. is something that's really important yeah. because Instagram, I have one kind of audience, my blog, I have another kind. Um, and so I think that's important, but I think, you know, about a week before I launched Accidental Icon, I was in Montreal and Garant's door, who I admired, she was the one blogger. I was like, okay, 
she's remotely someone I could identify with. And she was giving a talk at a bookstore in Montreal and we were there. So I went to hear her and I spoke to her after and said, I'm starting a, you know, a blog in a week. What's your advice? And she said, be yourself. Warts and all. Yeah. And I think that was the best advice that I got. I think people are craving that right now. I think really being honest about what we're all going through um, during this time, uh, but at the same time, being optimistic uh, is, is a really important voice. I think again, saying no is more important than saying yes in the beginning. And I think a lot of people will say, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. And then they lose sight of who they are. And so I think as painful as it is, um, to say no, uh, when you're trying especially to make a living from this, it will get you a lot more yeses later on. Right. That's and so, great. That's yeah. Great. That's and, and then the other thing is educate yourself. Do not underestimate your own worth. Um, I had a few big glaring uh, issues when I first started. Uh, a very big, big, big fashion brand Um, took photos. I went to a casting call. They took photos. They said, oh, if we use your photo, we'll give you this very minimal amount. And I get an email. Oh, it's very exciting. We're using your photo. I'm giving you a minimal amount. And a month later, I started to get uh, texts and photos from all over this photo was in every major fashion magazine in an ad. Yeah. So educate yourself, yeah. read the dotted line. Fine print. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, love it. Yeah. I guess that's the, that's the best. I always know when something's wrong for me, when I'm like, Ugh, I, I don't, don't want to do this. Yeah. So you, you want know. this. Yeah, you want it to be exciting. You want it to be life-giving. Yeah. And and if you do that, you will look full of life and you that will make people engage with you more. Lynn, thank you so much. This was such a, a great discussion. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And to everyone who tuned in, thank you so much. Remember, this uh, this panel is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it later. Thank you, Lynn, again so much. Oh, thank you. Great questions. It was a great conversation. I agree. Thank you, Lynn. And have a great night to you and to everyone else. Thank you so much. Same to you. And thanks, everyone, for joining.